Good morning. Now, happy uh, Daylight Savings time. Congratulations, all of you that remember to set your clocks ahead or use your cell phone to wake up. I read a thing last night that Pastor Chuck Smith never would uh, do Daylight Savings time until after church, would let the people sleep in. So, but that was, the day, that was before the days of cell phones and automatic clock settings. We're going to be in Luke chapter 18 this morning pick up our study exactly where we left off. Um, Luke chapter 18, verse 18. But I want to look again at verse 17, where Jesus was speaking to his disciples. And he said, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And you remember we spoke of the way in which a little child comes to Jesus, full of faith and trust. Most of your children woke up this morning with the expectation that there would be breakfast, that the Lucky Charms box would be full or Cheerios or whatever, that they would be provided for. There was no doubt or question in their mind of that. I don't think we've ever had a kid back in children's ministry or at VBS exclaim, I'm, I'm just not ready for Jesus to be my savior yet. I've got to clean myself up first, straighten some things out before I can come to him, before Jesus will accept me. As adults, we seem to get tripped up over that. We just don't get it. And we fail to understand that the only thing that we have to offer the savior is our sin. Once we give him that, he provides everything else that we need. And this morning, we're going to read about a grown-up that struggled with just having the simple faith of a child. So verse 18, Luke chapter 18, starts out, Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning. And Lord, we trust that you've got something to say to each of us today. Lord, as we read about these things in the past, that they would apply to our present. And that your words would speak to us corporately, Lord, but also as individuals. And I pray through your Holy Spirit, Lord, that today you would convict, you would correct, you would draw. Lord, you would change things for eternity for people here today. So, Lord, we ask, speak, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. What shall I do to have eternal life? What do I need to do? Was his question. And many people operate on the same premise as the young man that we read about in our story. Uh, just from what we've read so far, what do we know about the certain man that questioned Jesus? Rich, yes. He was rich. He was a ruler, right? Verse 18 says that he was a ruler. Verse 23, as Milton pointed out, says that he was rich. And when we look in the Gospel of Matthew, we read that he was young. The story is often called the rich young ruler. And it gets that title as you compile all of what the Gospels, all of what Matthew, Mark, and Luke put together. And we piece that together together. 
into the story of the rich young ruler. The fact that he was a ruler indicates that he had some authority, some position or status over others. Also, he was rich. I don't have time to explain to you folks in Old Town or the people in the state of Maine what being rich is. Uh, not of a, a lot of us have experienced that, but this guy could pay his bills, all of them, still go out to supper and have stuff left over. So he was rich. He was wealthy. Plenty of leftover. Matthew tells us that he was young. And some of us here are beginning to understand how valuable and treasured youth is. So by all accounts, this guy had it all, except he didn't. Deep down inside, he knew that something was missing. And we see that again in, in his question that he asked Jesus. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do? And many people operate on that same premise. They kind of visualize this giant scale in the sky that will be loaded up with the good that I've done and be balanced out by the bad. And, and hopefully the good somehow outweighs the bad. So his question really is, what do I need to do to tip the scales? Do I need to build something? Do I need to teach Sunday school or throw a fiver in the offering, maybe? What is it going to take? It's a valid question. And I actually applaud the guy for asking the question. You may remember a time in your life when you wondered the same thing. Unfortunately, I think we've come to a time in our society, a point in our moral and spiritual decline that people have stopped asking that question as they've stopped caring about the answer. The simple answer to his question, what shall I do to in inherit eternal life, is nothing. We all will inherit eternal life, but, I want to make sure the sound clip doesn't get cut off there, but we won't all have the same destination. Each one of us will experience eternal life. That being spent either in glory, in the presence of God, in heaven, or in a state of eternal torment in a place called hell. This man desired the prior. He wanted to go to heaven, and he begins by calling Jesus a good teacher. And that sounds completely normal to us. We've often heard Jesus referred to as a prophet or a good man or a moral teacher, or as this man calls him, a good teacher, when people talk about, even in the world, when they talk about Jesus, he was a good teacher. But what we don't always understand is in this day, that was not at all a common expression that someone would use. It was never um, written down as something that was prescribed even to a rabbi. It was solely reserved for God. So it's interesting to me that this young guy used that title when he spoke about Christ, when he spoke to Christ. Maybe he was impressed with Jesus or somewhat in awe, and it was just a, an utterance that came out, good teacher. Or possibly, as he was out to get something, it was an attempt to flatter, to get on Jesus' good side. Ultimately, the title was appropriate. If anyone could ever receive or wear that title of good teacher, it was Jesus. But the title of good teacher would not be true if Jesus weren't God. If Jesus taught the things that he taught and said the things that he said, and they weren't all true, he wouldn't have been good at all. You've heard it said that Jesus is either Lord or a liar, right? Either Lord or a lunatic, if he believed the things that he said about himself and they weren't true, he would have been crazy. Think of how radical Jesus was. Think about how exclusive Jesus is. In the words of the good teacher, there are not many roads to heaven. There's one way to heaven, through him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in response to this question that the young man asked, 
what shall I do to inherit Jesus, eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? Was it because you're impressed? Was it because you know that's a title reserved for God? Are you calling me God? Why do you call me good? Jesus also knows, if you look at verse 20, that this young man knew what the commandments were. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Because how, how many in this day and age that we live, how many do you think even know the commandments? Not many, sadly, in most churches, if I were to say, okay, stand up, rattle off however many you can, we may struggle to come up with all of them. Certainly, if you went on the street and challenged somebody and asked them what the Ten Commandments were, they would have difficulty rattling them off in accordance to Scripture. But they, they do understand the principles of them. The principles of the commandments are written on our hearts. If you went out on the street and you said, uh, is it okay to cheat on your spouse? You think that's all right to, to, to commit adultery? No, that's not right. Do you think it's okay to kill somebody? Is it all right to murder? Well, no. Even though they, they don't have this moral standard. Do you think it's okay to take something that doesn't belong to you? Do you think it's okay to steal? Is it okay to lie? Should kids respect their parents? They get the principle. This man's response when, when Jesus says this to him all these things I have kept from my youth. All these things I've kept, probably meaning since my bar mitzvah, since age 13, Lord, I've done these things. And what do you suppose Jesus' response was? What would your response be if somebody said, yeah, I've, been, I've kept all the commandments since I became an adult? <laughs> Raspberry or something? Baloney? They didn't have baloney back then, so <clears throat> malarkey, maybe, you would think. Jesus responds to him with compassion. It says in verse 22, So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. You know, we, get, we pick up, I, I mentioned putting all the Gospels together and, and Mark actually gives us something that I think is important that, that tells us that Jesus didn't laugh at him when he said this. And I think it reveals quite a bit about the heart of Jesus. Mark chapter 10, verse 21, the same scene. It says, then Jesus looking at him, loved him. That was our Savior's response. Knowing, certainly in his heart, he, he could not possibly have kept the commandments. But it, and notice even the commandments that he gave. He gave all the commandments that relate to how we relate to our fellow man. right? And, and he rattled those off to him. And, and the man said, those I have kept. And Jesus' response looked at him, loved him, and said, you, you still lack. There's one thing. I think about this guy. He had... Everything that everyone wanted. He had wealth. He had power. He had youth. But Jesus says you still lack one thing. That's not enough. The guy that appeared to have everything knew deep down in his heart that something was still missing. And that's what prompted the question. And Jesus answers him honestly. You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. Does that mean that all of us have to, have to get rid of all of our possessions? This guy did. This was applicable to him. This was his, his God that he put before the Lord, the thing that he held back. Notice, too, that he didn't say burn all your stuff, right? Give it away, make use of it, sell it, let others profit from it. But for you... That's an obstacle that's keeping you from me. You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Jesus is saying, you're going to have treasure. Don't worry about this stuff. You're going to have treasure. And then gives that invitation and come 
follow me. And when you look at the language there, it means come join me, come walk alongside me, be my disciple. So this is an invitation to say, hey, come with us, be a part of this, that Jesus extends to this man. This close, guys, this close. You know, in Hebrews, the Bible says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. You guys getting this? You're not, are you? Hmm. Let us, aside, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. There we go. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. But when he heard this, oh, I'm sorry, wow. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. You guys aren't changing stuff back there, are you? Okay, don't, don't touch it, please. All right. Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So here's the deal. I think the enemy is messing with our slides. <laughs> because you've got this young guy um, that, we'll just leave it alone. You got this young guy that thought he had it all. He had everything that everyone wanted. He had wealth, he had riches, he had youth, but he lacked. And Jesus said, there's this one thing that is standing between you and you coming alongside me and you being a part of this and you having everything that I desire for you. And for this man, it was his stuff. But it may be something completely different for you. You may be a backslidden Christian and have, and have wandered away. And there's something that is keeping you from restoring that relationship with God. It may not be stuff for you. It may be a person. It may be a relationship. You may be a, a self-righteous Christian and Jesus loves you too. But that may be hindering you from receiving all, all that he has for you. That may be the weight. And, and I'll say, as you're sitting here, squirming in your seat, not now because I said it, but, and the Holy Spirit is laying that on your heart, that thing that's separating, that thing that you're holding on to, that, that weight, that sin that's ensnared you that the Holy Spirit identifies, you need to give that to Jesus, that you wouldn't live in such a way of wondering what you could have had. You wouldn't walk away, wouldn't walk away from here today sorrowful. You wouldn't walk away sad. You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when he heard it, he walked away, sorrowful, for he was very rich. Verse 21. Sorry. We'll get there. Let's go to verse 24, see if that works. Yes. And when Jesus saw that he became sorrowful, he said, how hard it is. Okay. Let me try one thing. Then we're going old school. Okay. Yeah, we didn't do that, did we? 
All right, verse 24. We good? Okay. No, we're not, are we? Yeah, okay. And when Jesus saw that he became sorrowful, he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Who then can be saved? You guys understand the perception of those that were there. They saw this rich young guy and in riches and blessing were an indication that God was on board with him. Right? God had blessed. That's why he was like that. So if he wasn't going to go to heaven, they were terrified. What does that mean for them? You know, they were, they were out of contention for it. Look at what Jesus says in verse 25. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Um, I joked about having to explain what being rich is. But the truth is, hardly ever does one consider themselves rich. How many of you guys, I won't ask, because our, our uh, elders will be writing it down for ties and stuff. Not many of us consider ourselves rich. You know, but consider yourself in the context that this was spoken the standard of living that they would have had. Even the rich young ruler, I don't know what ride he rolled up in to this scene, but no matter which bucket of bolts you drove in on this morning, light years ahead of where they were. You know, the fact that we've got clothes and, you know, not all of us wore the same clothes last time we were here and that our bellies are full and there's, there's maybe some dollars in our pocket or change. We are rich. Not just in, in the perspective of our world, but in perspective where this was spoken. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. We've all heard that taught before this section. And I, I don't know how you've heard it taught. Oftentimes, anybody ever hear the story of the needle gate in Jerusalem? And that that's what Jesus was talking about, that there was a gate in the city. That's like, that's a preacher story, okay? That's not true. There's no needle gate. But the story goes was that there's a needle gate, a real narrow gate at the entrance of the city. And if you stripped everything off the camel, took off all the weight and burdens, and you got a guy in front pulling and a guy in back pushing, and he was stripped down to nothing else, no, no hindrances of the world, that camel could get down on its knees and squeeze through the eye of the needle. It's not, not true, friend. Can't happen. I mean, think about the eye of a needle and a camel. You could grind that sucker up and still couldn't get it through. It, it even says that it is impossible. So what do you think Jesus is trying to say? It's impossible. It is impossible. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, the things that are impossible. So can a rich man go to heaven? It's impossible on his own. It's impossible by his own means. It's impossible if like the rich young ruler, he says, what must I do? What can I do? What do, what do I need to do to tip the scales? It's impossible. There's nothing that you can do. But what is impossible with men is possible with God. Again, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peter responds to this in verse 28. Then Peter said, see, we've left all and followed you. Way to go, Pete. We've walked away from it all, Lord, and we followed you. So he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time 
and in the age to come, eternal life. There's, there's a cost to following Jesus, guys, but not a sacrifice long term. He says, even in this world, and that's a choice we don't even think about in this country, but in other countries, when you walk away, when you walk away from the Islamic faith, you may be walking away from mother, father, sister, brother. You may be walking away from your household, your income, all of those things. But Jesus says, you shall receive many times more in the present time and in the age to come. Verse 31, then he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the son of man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them and they did not know the things which were spoken. How many times? This is at least the third time in Luke that Jesus has told them exactly what was going to happen. And it went right over their heads. And I don't know if, if, like it says here, the sayings were hidden from them or if it was just denial. But this is important for us to understand, guys. They knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew what was going to happen as he approached Jerusalem. I've talked about it, I think, each of the last three weeks that his face was set like flint going towards Jerusalem, knowing he was heading to the cross. And for those of you that, that may be like this rich young ruler and are, and are questioning Jesus, I encourage you to look at biblical prophecy. I want to go through just a couple of them. I'm going to read them, but out of Psalm 22, and you can jot these down. There are, there are several. There's actually over 300 Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus. But Psalm, Psalm 22, 13 through 19 says, They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. Oh, you have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You guys understand this was written a millennial before the cross. This was written before crucifixion was even thought of. Prophesied in the scriptures. I, count, I can count my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. We'll read about this as we approach Easter, as we approach Resurrection Sunday. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Another one you can jot down in Isaiah chapter 50. Verses 6 and 7. I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Isaiah 53. Read all of Isaiah 53, guys. But starting in verse 3, he's despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Over 300 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How do you, how do you fulfill 
the prophecy of where you will be born. It was prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem. And he was literally born in Bethlehem. In the book of Daniel, it was prophesied that the Messiah would come before Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. And he literally died and came, came and died before the city and temple were destroyed. I'll tell you, if, if you have doubts about Jesus, one of the best remedies to that is to study biblical prophecy. Go to the Alpha Omega Bible study tomorrow night. That's, that's what that is. Going through the prophecies, going through creation, and going through end times prophecies. Back to Luke. Then it happened, verse 35, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man, we know from the other gospels that his name was Bartimaeus, sat by the roadside begging, and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. Remember, he can't see. He just hears this crowd, hears this disruption. Something's happening. So what does it mean? What's going on? Verse 37 says, So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Wait a minute. What was this guy in need of? He was blind, right? What would you ask Jesus for? I, I love that his first cry, his initial cry to Jesus is, you know what? I know I don't deserve this. I know I don't deserve anything from you. So Lord, have mercy on me. That was his appeal to Jesus. And verse 40 says, uh, actually, verse, let's see. Have mercy on me. You got to be kidding me. You know what? I think we're missing verse 38, aren't we? 39, 38. Hold on. 38. Cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those that went before warned him that he should be quiet. You ever been shut down by a, a religious leader or a deacon or an elder? The, this guy was crying out to Jesus. And those that went before him told him that he should be quiet, that he should shut up, stop calling out to the Lord. But he cried out all the more. When you read the commentaries, it, it relates this secondary cry like the howling or screaming of a wild animal. This is what he was doing, crying out to Jesus in that way. And, he, and he's crying out. Remember, it's not always the amount of your faith, but in, in who you place your faith. He knows, son of David, have mercy on me. Again, this appeal for mercy. Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 40, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought near him. And when he had come, he asked him saying, what do you want me to do for you? Why do you think Jesus asked him that? I mean, he, he's blind. Jesus clearly knew he was blind because he said, hey guys, bring him to me. But I also, I, there's, there's so much in this story. But Jesus is traveling on, face set like flint, going to Jerusalem, heading towards the cross. And there's a guy in need crying out for mercy. And Jesus stops in his track and listens to the one. Just like he would have done with the rich man if he surrendered to him. But he stops for the need of the one. And like I said, your, your need may not be that you give up possessions. It may be something else. It may be, again, whatever the Holy Spirit was laying on your heart. But Jesus hears that cry. Jesus stood still. He stopped in his tracks and commanded him to be brought near him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Jesus knew. I think sometimes he wants us to know. Wants us to know what it is that we're actually asking for. Wants us to verbalize it to him. Not in a power play. But that our true need can be identified. And he does want us to ask. 
wants us to come to him. What do you want me to do for you? And he calls him Lord. He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. You ask for mercy, I'm, I'm giving you mercy. He asked for sight, receive your sight. This man had nothing, no job, didn't even know what was going on, right? He's asking others, hey, can somebody tell me what's going on? He started with nothing and ended with everything. Verse 43 says, and immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Isn't that awesome? Maybe that, you know, that's, that's, that's my question this morning for you. Is, is which of these two guys are you? Is there something that you're holding on to? And, and really what this rich man said, why he went away so sad, is because that thing was more important to him than God. What must I do to have eternal life? Uh, when it comes right down to it, I want this more. And he walked away sad. Are you the one that appears to have it all, but knows deep down inside there is something you're lacking, something that's still missing? And will you walk away sad? Or will you be like blind Bartimaeus that knows he deserves nothing? All that he has to offer is his sin. Lord, have, have mercy on me. And maybe that's been you. Maybe you just haven't seen it before because you've been blind. Your eyes have been shut to the truth. And today's the day for you to cry out and ask for mercy. Ask that the Lord would give you sight. And notice his response. The Lord gave him his sight. He could see your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight. And then what? He followed him. He didn't just receive. That's, that's a picture I see in, in the church as a whole. People receive. They want fire insurance. They don't want to go to hell. They want to receive. But following, well, that's something different. The, the come alongside, the invitation that was given to the rich man. Walk with me. Follow me. Live as I live. Do as I do. Let me be the Lord or the boss. This man, his life changed. Yes, because he could see, but more so because he followed Jesus. He glorified God. You know, I hate Facebook. Makes me angry. I, there's some good things about it. I saw a post yesterday that I told myself I wasn't going to bring up in church. But somebody, somebody quoted that quote. A pastor quoted that quote. I don't remember the quote. I'm so irritated. Uh, preach often, if necessary, use words. Equals bogus. Um, it's not applicable to the church. Could you ever imagine the Apostle Paul speaking this? It's not how you make disciples. Let's look at this guy, this blind guy. Hey, uh, I'm gonna... He followed Jesus. It doesn't say then he stood on a corner and he preached doesn't say he delivered his first sermon. He followed Jesus and he glorified God and all the people saw it. They saw his life. They saw a change in him. They saw Jesus in him, right? Because I can stand up here all day long, but when I go out there, if I'm not living it, if you can't see it in my life, then everything coming out of my mouth is garbage. We live in a world where people seek and long for authenticity. They seek and long for truth. Christian, 
little Christ, right? We are, we are to, to have Jesus in us and model that. People are to know that we are saved by our love. There should be evidence in our life. This guy followed Jesus, glorified God. People saw it. And the response of the people that saw it, they gave praise to God. That needs to be us, guys. We need to respond, not just receive, but follow with every aspect of our life. Jesus gives that invitation to both of these guys. And he gives that invitation to you. And I would encourage you to preach with your life. And as the Lord gives opportunity, yeah, use words. Use money. Bless them with needs that they may have. Things like that. But your biggest sermon better be your life. If you want to be an effective Christian. <sighs> okay. Ended better than I thought it would. Social media thing. Let's pray. Father, Lord, you know the hearts and minds of every person in here. You know what's going on. Lord, I'm so grateful for that, that passage that we read, that your response to that man, even at the point, even, even when he professed to have kept all the commandments, you loved him. And Lord, I, I pray, number one, that everyone here this morning gets that whether they be the, the backslidden Christian, the self-righteous Lord, or somebody that has not yet surrendered their life to you, that they would understand the depth of your love, that you would send your own son to bear the burden of their sin and shame, to not just cover it up, to, but, but to remove it, to cleanse them, to make them righteous. What must we do to have eternal life? So Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit. If there's anyone here that is letting the things of the earth hold them back, is letting any sin ensnare them, that they would look to you, the author and finisher of their faith, and surrender it. That they would receive you as Savior and follow you as Lord, as boss. Lord, have your way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If anyone needs prayer, afterwards there will be people up front here that will be happy to pray with you.